The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. We see this beast architecture rising up, slowly rising, and we're discovering who we are in Jesus Christ, who we are in the Lord, what the Lord sees us, how He sees us, what He thinks about His children, what resides within His children. That means what resides within you. What are the do's and don'ts of being a child of the Most High? A great many people walk around in fear and they don't have to, but it's pretty simple. You know what that is? You guys are going to see it more and more. People simply don't trust the Father. They trust what they are used to. You guys know the feeling when you go into a new house and it takes you a while to get accustomed to that house or apartment or wherever you may dwell. For those of you soldiers who get, uh, you get stationed somewhere and you get put in a new barracks, you have new housing off posts, it, it takes you a while to get used to it. Because the fact is you don't trust your environment has to be comfy to you first, has to be comfy to you. What's happening with people in the body of Christ, a lot of them, and we discussed this about two weeks ago, but what's happening to a lot of them is this, their comfort by the news, by other things, is being shattered. Their comfort is being shattered. Now, a few weeks ago, we did discuss that eventually a person will become who they are, which is to say their acting career will be over. What's in the darkness? will be made manifest. A lot of us, the truth of us resides in our hearts, not in our speech, certainly not in our actions. It resides in the heart and eventually, ultimately, what's in the heart will manifest itself because the fire is coming. The Lord is sending that fire. It will both expose and incinerate anything that's not His, but it's a good thing. You see, His fire is a good thing. I, for one, do not want something attached to me that needs to be burned off. So he'll send that fire to burn it off. We don't need it. And it takes him to remove certain things out of our lives. Just as it takes him to reveal or give revelation of things that we never ever thought could possibly be so that we can understand certain things. Mankind cannot do that for you. The only revelation they can give you are those things which they have discovered. And they only discover those things that God has already done, yet they have no revelation of his ultimate truth, of who he actually is. They stumble and have issues with it because the Lord did not give them proof. Why in the world would the Lord give proof when he requires faith? It's impossible to please the Lord without faith. So yes, he wants us to work by faith. That's why he left no proof of a great many things. He left pieces here and pieces there. Fallen angels all around the world showing men where to dig up this and dig up that. If these things are so powerful, why do they get men to do their dirty work? Why can't they do it themselves? You ever ask yourself that? The demon is so terrible. Why do they have to have a host and then, then do their terrible things? Do you want to know why? They have limitations, great limitations. They absolutely know the laws of God. They have no love within them. They can't have a reward. They simply are. They have a desire, compulsion. Just like Satan now has a desire and a compulsion. He can't praise the Lord. He's being stripped of a great many things. The love that works within you is the power of God, period. He cannot operate in that environment. He can't. He's defeated. Already is defeated. You need to know that prior to this beast system architecture being exposed to. Tonight we're going to talk about certain delusions. You know, you guys heard that uh, saying, strong delusion. It's going to be a strong delusion sent to you. You want to hear something. That delusion is already established. Now that's a challenging thing, isn't it? Do you know how many people occupy that delusion? Right now, great many of them. They occupy that delusion. There's a purpose and a reason for that delusion. Not to be confused with this. That the Lord said, he, he did not say that you're going to be thrown in that delusion. Right? He didn't say that. That delusion serves a purpose. The filtering process is to draw men out into it. They will be damned because of it, because it exposes the true nature of a heart. And there are two seeds in this world, those seeds of the living God and a seed of Satan. Two seeds exist simultaneously in this world. There are people of Satan 
that walk around them just like you and I do. And there are people of God with the seed of love within them. The seed of the Father, its origins are from the Father. But the other seeds have an appearance of goodness. They are in fact the seed of Satan. They were raised just like you were. They function a little differently. They can't bring themselves to believe as you believe. They can't bring themselves to be as compassionate as you can be compassionate. They can't bring themselves to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. Other than that, there's little distinction at the moment. They're out there. All of us probably know quite a few of them. They're out there. To understand them and their function, you have to understand the beast's architecture. You have to understand it. Listen, there's a scripture that says no seed of God will remain in the world, in this world. None. No seed of God's going to remain serving this world, but will in fact return to the Father in their hearts and truth. Before they ever go to Him, they will return back to Him. They'll turn back to Him. We need to discuss these two seeds. Most importantly, you need to know some of the do's and don'ts, exactly who they are. Someone just asked, can they be saved? Can Satan be saved? Can a demon be saved? You see, these things, hundreds of thousands, millions, trillions of years old, we don't know how old they are, but they're ancient. They were made eternal, the fallen were. They were not made like you and I. They were made eternal, much like you would make a keyboard for a computer. Well, if the keyboard stops functioning as a keyboard, what do you do with it? What do you do with a broken keyboard? You replace it. What do you do with the old one? You throw it away. They're not made like you and I. But if you buy a hamster, and the hamster's not acting right, what do you do? You take it to a vet because it's sick. You're right. They're not made like you and I. They were made eternal. They were made for a purpose. They had all, they had knowledge that you couldn't possibly imagine. They were made for a purpose. They're not made like you and I. They were made with specifics. Okay, now in this beast system, listen, Revelation 3, 4. Well, let's go back because we're discussing simply the beast architecture. Listen to this, Revelation 13, 1. And I stood upon the sands of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. We're not reading the whole 13, uh, chapter 13 of Revelation. Having seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns, ten crowns, and upon his heads, the names of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth were as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, seat, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? Listen, these folks worshipped the beast. They worshipped him. They were loyal to him. They worshipped him. But here's the key. It says in Revelation 13, 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Did you read that? Slain from the foundation of the world? Let me say it again. Slain from the foundation of the world? Slain from the foundations of the world. In other words, it was already decided. And if it was already decided as it was explained here, then you were already decided upon. Do you understand that? The Lord declared the end by the beginning. That goes for you too. You are his prized child. He nurtures you. He allows you to explore and bump your head. He comforts you and brings you back. He does not want you lost. He's not going to lose you. Someone asked, can a seed of Satan be saved? It's too late for them. You see, a seed of the serpent, Satan's seeds are very different than you are. There's a capacity for things they don't have. Their origins are very different than yours. In fact, they are sneaky. There are people who have ancient knowledge and they are very sneaky. They act as though they don't have the knowledge that they really do have. These folks have ancient things within them. They are mingled in amongst you. To make you hurt yourself, they can't hurt you directly. They want you to hurt yourself. They want you to turn away from the faith. Their sole purpose in life is to serve that purpose, to turn you against the Almighty God. That's their purpose. And But the sad part is they're going to prosper for a great many of us because many will fall away from the faith. No one just automatically falls away from the faith. You're challenged with something. But your name, if it's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and if you continue to reach for Jesus Christ, enduring until the end, your Redeemer shall come for you. You endure until the end. But there are some who are not going to endure because they never could accept Jesus Christ in his fullness. They knew of him, but they couldn't accept him. All of this is part of the beast architecture. 
to make you stumble in the worst way. The architecture is the is the plan, be a piece of paper. The architecture would be the foundations of the system are on earth right now. Foundations are. They want you to stumble. And anyone who does not understand who they are is in danger. They don't understand who they are. You see, the Lord said that if it were possible, the very elect would be deceived. That's not to be confused with the delusion. The Lord's going to give some over to a reason that they may believe a lie. Why does he want them to believe a lie and be given over to that delusion that they all might be damned? That has nothing to do with the deception of the very elect. You see, those who accept the mark of the beast are nowhere close to near the very elect. They're not. If your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you will not accept the mark of the beast, period. Do you know why you won't accept the mark of the beast? If your name is within the Lamb's Book of Life, your Father's eyes are continually upon you. He will dispatch what he needs to dispatch to keep you. If you could see the activity around you that is good from the Father, you wouldn't have a worry in the world, but it requires faith for you to endure until the end. That's why you can't see what's going on around you. You wouldn't need faith if you saw your own protection with you. But you need to understand who you are. Half the troubles you go through in your life right now, not in the past. Everything in your past was made for the good of who you are now. It's made for the good of who you are. All things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and will call according to his purpose. Which means even your worst days in the past are for your good. So you wouldn't be as strong as you are had you not endured the pain of your life. And listen to me, that pain was against what? Your flesh, your ego, your pride, your earthly dreams, your earthly aspirations. It made you strong. And then what is the Lord doing? He's giving you a new vision, a new hope, a new way in Him. You are in fact a new creature. And Satan still, he, he tries, but now you can see the distance between yourself and him because you're above the age of accountability now. Back to the architecture. This is going to get really strange tonight. It's important that you know currently we see that one system is being dissolved and another one is being exposed. All political arguments are being formed to support the necessity for new governance and new governing methodologies. They're doing this on purpose, by the way. They're doing this so that when you even look and it's worked because some of you will look at CNN and you get disgusted some of you look at Fox and you get disgusted you can't see it some of you look at MSNBC and you, you, you just get disgusted what they did was they broke your confidence a certain type of person they broke your confidence from it here's the funny part now hear me out we're going to speak real your confidence is broke in mainstream media but for some of us we still cannot hear the voice of the Lord enough so we search out mainstream media on the internet, not alternative media, mainstream media on the internet. Why? Because it all comes down to trust. It comes down to trust, trusting the Lord. Now someone may say, well, I trust the Lord. Really? So you never complain about anything? Not me, not one thing do you complain about? Not one thing do you worry about? Trust is something that is gained in our trials. The Lord is doing us how he needs to do us because we have to become like little children. You see, we started out as children. We grew up into adults in the world, only to find out that the, all those things that we learned is nonsense, most of it. And now the Lord is growing us back into that little child. Again, he's purifying us. The parents, when they're good children, they ask questions all the time. But never once will a child that has a child that can't talk. You know, the children with the bottles that go in the middle, the little babies, they don't ask the parent. But excuse me, did you put this, is this milk at the proper temperature? They don't ask their parents, oh, pardon me, is this the right type formula? They don't do that. They don't question them. You know what they do? They receive, receive, receive. You know what we do as adults? We spend our time questioning everything. We've been trained to question everything that we were not taught. And who taught you what you know? The world system. But when the word is introduced to you and you come out of the world system, you instantly begin to question things in there. Why? Because it goes against everything you learned. And some people do not like change. It breaks their comfort. They were comfortable thinking that they knew what they knew and they were good with that. So let me go watch a movie. That's what they say. 
as soon as you introduce Christianity to them and they begin to read the New Testament and they begin to hear the words of the prophets and they begin to hear prophecy, they're like, wait a minute, this is too much. There's no way this can be real. Knowing this, the establishment puts out shows like Ancient Aliens, which is the, you know, I have to say, that's the dumbest thing I've heard because listen to this. Here's what they say. I watched an episode of it. You know what they say? They said, well, people thought it was God, but it was an extraterrestrial. Well, an extraterrestrial means not from here. God's not from this planet. He made this planet. How dumb is that? Listen to me. How dumb is that? People's perception is all messed up. If something is not from Earth, it's an ex it's extraterrestrial. It's outside of this planet. Of course God is outside of this planet. He was not born on Earth. What is wrong with people? What's wrong with people? You see, they, they use this language, which makes people not understand the truth of what they're talking about, right? They mint words. That's like saying, um, you know, was Gabriel and Michael, are they extraterrestrial? Look up the word extraterrestrial. And then look up the word terrestrial. Terrestrial means from here. Extraterrestrial means from somewhere else. That's it. But you see, when you look at the word ET, most people don't even know what ET stands for. They say, oh, then that little creature on that show. Or little guys with big eyes. What about the bacteria that fell in the 1980s, which was an actual cell without DNA? How about that? Now that's extraterrestrial. They've proven that because it came off of a comet. They found the bulk of the, the, the major part of the rock and it had liquid inside the rock. How about that? That stuff that caused a red rain was not from Earth. It was not dust. It was not ba uh, bacteria. It was not human waste bacteria. This was a life form that was found inside a meteorite. You didn't hear that one, did you? Oh, and they replicate pretty fast. Oh, and they're having a hard time killing them. Temperatures don't work and, and uh, a host of things don't work. They're still living today. They go dormant when they want to and they wake up when they want to. You see how things work? But the Lord told us that he would, there would be signs in the heavens, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. That's what he said. Blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. You know, a lot of people read that scripture and it just, you know, they just read it. By the way, I believe that's Joel 2, 30. Let's go there. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood, and fire and pillars of smoke. Now, listen to this premise. If the end is determined by the beginning, we better find out how the Lord works in things. We need to review what happened to Egypt upon the deliverance of his people, because in the end, what is he doing? He's delivering his people. Finally, for all time, he's delivering his people. All of his children will be delivered. That's why this time, the signs and wonders that will be shown in the earth will be massive. Egypt will be a dot on a piece of paper compared to what's going to happen. Now, when I read this verse in Joel 30, Joel uh, 2, verse 30, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Now, that sentence, the way it's formulated, goes together. It's full of, uh, it has a clause in there. He defined the wonders in the heavens and in the earth. Now, do you know what a pillar of smoke is? If it's a wonder, Normally when he says, I will show wonders, it's something that mankind did not do. Now they have an issue, they have a problem with this non-DNA type substance turning the rain red coming from meteorites. By the way, they have not stopped exploding all over the place. There's a problem. I'm not talking about uh, algae blooms either. We know what the fire and the pillars of smoke, we know what that is. Normally you see a pillar of smoke after what? Volcanic eruption. He said pillars, plural, of smoke. Volcanic eruption. Fire, of course, during an ejection, rocks, molten uh, rocks, very hot rocks, can go up thousands of feet, land back into yards, houses, and everything else, and begin to burn things up. We know that volcanism is coming. And the Lord said in those days, now listen, all this stuff you do not have to worry about. Do you not know that all these things that are going to happen to the earth are for your benefit, not for your destruction? That's something you need to know. Stop getting scared when you hear prophecy. I can't stress that enough, that you need to know the prophecies, but you need to know them by the precepts of God, not the precepts of men. It 
these things are not coming to destroy you. They're coming for you. It is a, it is your final deliverance. Do you think Egypt underwent all it went through? And by the way, when the plagues and things hit Egypt, where were the Hebrews? Were they in Egypt? They were not let out of captivity then. Did it touch any of them? No, it did not. Do you understand that? These plagues were in Egypt when God's people were there, but did it touch them? No, it didn't. It didn't touch them. How many people knew that? How many people considered they were right in the middle of it? When the plagues hit Egypt, all those things were for the deliverance of God's people. Now, was it scary to them looking at it? Yes, it was. You can see it for yourself. Go back and study and read it. You can see it for yourself. It was a little, you know, scary for them. But the Lord put things in place far before it happened. He sent Moses, which was the leadership. Aaron, which then talked to the people. He sent leadership to them. He kept telling them they're going to be delivered. You know, that same process is happening now. It's happening now. You see, before, I noticed, when they began to talk about deliverance prior to Moses, they gave up on it. Do you know they gave up on the deliverance idea? Listen to me. They gave up on the deliverance idea prior to Moses. They gave up. Their conversation was different. And so when Moses came talking and speaking about deliverance, it was almost laughable to them. What do we see happening now? You hear ministers saying, Jesus is coming, get ready. And what do you have some people doing? They're laughing. They're laughing because people have said this in the past. But in the past, they were not able to observe global events. You see, because the scriptures are very clear. You will see this, you will see that. You will hear of this, you will hear that. The only way you can see and both hear simultaneously is with instant communication. They didn't have that back then. Davy Crockett, Paul Revere, and all those guys, they couldn't get a letter fast enough back in those days, so it was not going to happen because one side of the world did not know what was happening in the other side of the world. And if they didn't know that, the gospel was not published throughout all the world. It has to be published to all nations throughout all the world. They couldn't have it back then. Israel was not a nation back then. And it all turns back to Israel. How many know that once the beast architecture is set up and the beast is on the scene, how many will understand the timing then? You see, the timing leads back to Israel anyway, regardless, always. It goes right back to Israel again. What are we looking for? The great falling away. If you want to know your time in prophecy, you need to gauge the great falling away, which means we're going to notice. Listen to me. We're going to notice a great falling away first. A great falling away will be noticed by us. We are such a privileged generation. We're a privileged generation because we're operating in a world with high deception, yet we still operate. We're operating in a world where people are giving up on the faith in Jesus Christ, yet we still have our faith. And when the Lord does come, we're going to be the ones to point and say, that's who I waited for. You see, the world cannot do that. They can't say, that's who I waited for. You can say, that's who I waited for. In fact, that same scripture is in the Bible about those folks. And they will point and say, that's who I waited for. Some people have lost focus. It's always so difficult to do. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. Difficulty is something I operate in every single day. You don't get used to difficulty. You overcome it, and it no longer is difficulty. Something else is it's certainly not difficulty. Difficult is when you stick your hand through a circle in a door and you can't get it back out. That's difficult. You're by no means trapped. Nothing is impossible for you. But people have fit their terminology of things. They have been programmed to think a specific way. Terms like, well, you know, I, I, I love the Lord and all, but uh, this is reality. You know what? Terms like that are just blasphemous in nature. That is, a, that is equivalent to saying this. I, I believe in God, but right now he's not what I need. Excuse me? That's what the equivalency is. You're saying you don't need God in your life when you do those things like that. I say stand up stronger and push harder and see the deliverance of the Lord in your life. You want to see it anyway. You want to have that victory. You want to see the deliverance. Well, oh, get up and push. You have power over the enemy. You can walk in this earth and tread upon scorpions and serpents. They have no venom toward you. You know what? In my tiny mind, those serpents and those scorpions are the people of you face in your life. Those are the people. You know why? Because people, they do what? They speak. You know what words are from a lot of people? It's venom. You can hear certain words and they can make you sick. 
You can hear certain words and it can ruin your entire day. That's venom. You can hear certain words and it will make you stop doing everything you're doing and you just want to sit there and die. That's venom. Venom is poisonous. It starts with one area and it goes throughout the body until it destroys your heart. Once your heart is affected, it's all over. You have power over that venom. Nobody's venom can work towards you. But listen, if no one tells you that you have an immunity to that venom, psychologically, you'll think it's winning. Psychologically, you'll think it's winning. And if you think something is killing you psychologically, but it's really not, that means you're in the world's crazy box and they're laughing at you. Well, you see, that's why speaking about the words of Jesus are so important. How in the world can the children of the Lord know who they are without the words of Jesus? How can they know that? We can't only hear those words of Jesus. We have to apply them. Meditate on them day and night. Think about them because you're much more than what you think you are. I don't say that to build up pride, but to lift up everybody who's a child of God. But why? Because it's the truth. Jesus spoke those words. Those are not my words. They're not your words. They're the words of Jesus Christ. And it gets better. Don't succumb to the venom of this world. You're an overcomer. You have the power within you to overcome these things. Psychologically, I'm telling you the problem. Due to the beast architecture being laid out over many, 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 many years, all of us, all of us have been exposed to it. That architecture within itself is a poison. It operates very slowly. It's very thorough in how it works. But the power of salvation and the blood of the Lamb breaks it. You see, you overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. The blood of the Lamb does the salvation part. It really saves you. The word of your testimony makes your armor so hard Satan can't get through it. The word of your testimony, the word of your testimony, is your encouragement. Listen, I'm going to be, how, let's be honest. How often do we sit down and really think of how we came to the Lord in the first place? How often do we think prior to coming to the Lord how rotten we were? And yet, we did come to the Lord. And yet, we felt the love he had towards us. He sent us teachers. He sent us people that encouraged us. He did formulate situations in our lives to elevate us. He did do these things. He did. How often do we think about that? What is the word of your testimony? What is it? What's that story? You know what? Even the Israelites were encouraged to remember. In fact, they do it today. Some of their holidays are designed so that they can never forget. But you know what? We won't do it. We won't do it. We will not remind ourselves how we came to Jesus Christ, our condition prior to that. Why? Because it builds your faith. Don't forget how he delivers you. Why? Because that builds your faith. I'm telling you what I know. You forget how he delivered you, you'll have problems in knowing that you're going to be delivered the next time. He sends you through trials and tribulations. You're given the word precept upon precept, line upon line, so that your faith is increased over time. Your patience is worked. Every time I get in a hard spot, when I'm in this crunch of decision making, I just begin to reflect on what the Lord already did for me. And you know what that does? It defeats the words of Satan. You take captive your thoughts. And if the Lord told us to take captive your thoughts, then something is wrong with our very thoughts. Satan can creep into your thoughts. He can mess with your hearing. He can do everything as part of the beast architecture. And if he hands over, if he gives the beast, I'm talking about Satan, if Satan gives the beast his power seat and great authority, then who has it now? Who's got the power of the seat and the great authority right now? Who's under him? That beast architecture and the delusion that people are under right now is working. Look around at the people in your life. Do they trust God or do they trust a system? I told you guys, the system has taken on a life of its own. No one can kill the system. No one. Can you see that the system itself is alive? It's alive. It does not matter who runs anything. They still yield to the system. Now that is a delusion. People expect the Constitution to work for them over a person. They expect the words to work for them over a person. I'd say the Constitution is a good part of it, but the rest of it, the other laws and stipulations and this, that, and the other, basically a bunch of books of how to govern human life. Books to say what group can have what. Groups that circumvent the Constitution, 
because they're undoing everything that was done in the name of the Lord, period. They're undoing it. Do you really think that Satan is going to have the Holy Bible and all its teachings at the head of his kingdom? No, I don't think so. He's going to undo anything that had anything to do with the Lord. And that's why the beast worships at God his fathers knew not. Something new will happen when the Antichrist, when that man of perdition or doom is revealed. There are ten kings who have not been appointed their kingdom as of yet, but will in a likeness exercise that power one hour with the beast, and they're going to hand their power over to the beast. These are folks sitting in the background. They're just waiting. But the falling away has to happen first. The falling away has to happen first. Then you'll see parts of the architecture you never thought existed. Now, I just showed you in the book of Joel, the Lord will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. Do you really want to hear the story of Egypt at the time of Moses? Do you guys really want to hear what happened? Some people read that and they think of it mildly, but see, they had historians that wrote down the true horror of what happened. It was horrible. Egypt was horrible. You, you, you guys ever hear this talk about the destroyer of worlds that comes, the destroyer of worlds that everybody in Egypt saw, that China saw? The people in the provinces around this place, they did see. Do you know that at the time Egypt was destroyed, now hear me out, at that very same time Egypt underwent those things. Did you not know that those in America underwent the same thing? Did you not know that other countries went to the same thing? Egypt got the grunt of it. Still, the Hebrews were untouched. What in the, are you telling me that the whole world endured something? and God's people were untouched. Do you not understand what's going to happen to you? You may see things, but if the Lord declared the end by the beginning, do you understand? People always say persecution is coming. Listen, persecution has been here. Persecution has been in this world for 2,000 years thus far. Since Jesus was resurrected, persecution has been... Do you not know what happened after Jesus left this earth? It was a time like no other. People were being burned at the stake, hung upside down, killed. Martyrs were all over the place. Those who believed in Jesus Christ, there are stories about people who would preach, and right after they finished, their heads were chopped off instantly. Not everybody, but some of them. People were killed. An entire race was almost wiped out. It was horrible. It was horrible in Egypt. Let me give you an example. There's some recorded documents of what happened in Egypt, and even Moses was mentioned. You know, people can't help but to write down history. Have you guys noticed that? If it's one thing they're going to do, they're going to document it day by day exactly what happened. And the one that is trusted in their documentation, their records are kept for another generation. As if the Lord said, this is going to be saved as a witness of what's going to happen again. They saw a destroyer coming toward the earth. You know what it looked like? It looked like a black hole with two dragons or serpents swimming around it. It was not absolutely circular. It always moved and slithered. When it came closer to the earth, dust began to form on the earth that was red. It started killing things and, and flies began to multiply and maggots. This same destroyer began to cause disease and a host of other things. But the strangest thing is this. From the destroyer came a light that entered the land of Egypt killing the firstborn of everybody. Some sort of light came out from in the middle of that destroyer coming to earth. It too was under the command of something of the Lord. Over here in America, when the destroyer came, they had to go underground. Why? Because they couldn't breathe on the surface. Now keep in mind, while everybody was having a hard time breathing, here we have the Israelites actually sparing the lives of a lot of Egyptians during this time of what happened because they were in the vicinity. But where they left, destruction followed to that place. Egypt was left in ruins. After they left, wars and stuff came to them, but then Israel began to mess up. The nations began to repopulate again. But it was horrible around the globe. Now, everybody's not going to tell the same story, and it'd be a false story. You see, a lot of them trying to come to America, the Egyptians. All those civilizations were somewhat transported to America. And you have to remember, our past is much like it is now. Didn't King Solomon say there's nothing new under the sun? That's what he said. He was the wisest man that ever was and ever will be. The wisest human being. 
He told it right. You see, they're still finding tenant shoe prints, 400 million year old rock. They're still finding watches in coal. Do you know how long it takes coal to form? It's a pretty long time. They're still finding tea kettles in rock deep into the earth. You see, they're still digging. So the deeper they dig, they begin to discover older civilizations. And the more they dig, the more advanced the items are. Wallpaper made of gold and silver. They were very good with metal. Can you imagine having metal wallpaper? I already told you about the electronic parts and so forth. The components, the measuring equipment. I'm not talking about things like the uh, uh, the, uh, at the Greeks, what the Greeks had. I'm talking about things that look like modern day components. You know why? Because the same fallen angels who had the same knowledge fell back then and they're doing the same thing right now. The technology boost happened actually in the 30s. The technology boost also happened back then. You know, there are stories that were written a long time ago of nuclear wars. There are so many things they lied about from history because they want you to never know that anything God actually allowed to be written in the Holy Bible is true. And if you knew the facts, you would not question the Word of God, but you would stand up as a child of God. The only reason we don't stand up is pure and simple. We doubt the Word of God. We doubt Him. If you knew for a fact you were a child of the Most High, you would stand up on your feet. The whole world lost because Gabriel and Michael were commanded to destroy everything on the earth. This was prior to the flood. They were commanded to destroy those things that the fallen angels had built. And you know what they did? They cast meteors to the earth. That's written. That's documented. But they lie so much. Have you noticed this? They're, they're very sneaky in how they present information. Listen to me. A long time ago, those of you who are beyond the age of, of, of 45, you know what I'm talking about. And um, when we went to school, we learned a specific history. Well, the history now is very different. Some of you have grandchildren. And if you read their history books, you'd say, what is this? You know, you should be nosy. If you, if you, if you can read your grandchild's book on history, you need, to, you, you need to read it. Some people find out, well, I can't even tell my grandchild anything I thought I knew because in this book it's saying something totally different. The emphasis has changed. Why? Because they're covering up the mistakes they had in the past, but they never, ever want to admit it. So they just slide in a new story to the new generation so that they believe in something that will perpetuate the world they're trying to create. What you've been taught, you have been taught so you can psychologically be conditioned to live within a system. What is that system? The beast system. You've been taught that way, to believe a specific way. Look at the children now. Are they being taught morals? Most of their education centers around accepting species fairly. See, we were taught to accept, or, or they attempted to teach us to accept, accept every, you know, your, your human race equally. They, they began to teach us this thing called equality, because that's when the racism began to die off, and they had to change everything because of civil rights and this, that, and the other. Well, see, now they're teaching these new kids to accept all species, or you won't believe the books that are supposed to come out next year. The mindset of them is this. If you had, think of this, your computer is programmed to accomplish tasks, right? If it can't accomplish the tasks you need for your personal future vision, you're going to go get one that will. They train children the same way. They're training children both in history and technology and the sciences and everything else to serve a future vision. And believe me, it goes through a giant thought process. They know these young kids will spend at least 10 years in school. Then they want these kids to contribute to the system. You see, they can't build the system themselves. They need a kingdom. A kingdom must have servants. A kingdom must have subjects. Or it wouldn't be a kingdom. So they need the, they need the population to think two things. Number one, they need the population to think that they're free. I'll get into that in a minute. They need them to think that they're free and that there is no system. And they need only a fraction of something they hope for to make them believe that they can get anything they hope for. 
The part about them believing that they are free, that is another part of the delusion. You see, people are going to accept the mark and they're not going to feel they're bound by anything. They're going to believe they too are free. And I'm, I'm attempting to tell you all this, hopefully, that you may see it in a different light. A life that will help you make better decisions based on the teachings of Jesus Christ when that time comes. Something that will build your faith so that you are aware beforehand. When you see it unfold, precisely as the word tells you, your confidence is going to go up. Listen, they want you to think you're free. So here's how they do that. They raise you with education to support the system. By the time you spend five years in school, it takes five years of education to cause a person to love the system. That's what it does. Now between five and up, you refine the thought process. All of it is psychological preparation for adulthood. Five and up, you're taught if you work for the system, all your dreams can come true, which takes a person's motivation and you know what they say? I'm going to have this job or that job or this job or that job. And yes, they will be the best at it because they know nothing about the system. One of the most important jobs for education is to teach everybody there is no system. That's foolishness. There is no there is no system. That's foolishness. Yet when they're an adult, they'll say, listen, you need to serve the system. But when you're a child, you're not taught that. This is why people go to college, right? They go to college. And then when they get in their regular position, they'll say, well, they taught me the old stuff in college. What is this? They didn't teach me this. I thought it was supposed to work this way. But it doesn't. It works that way. They lied to me. You know how many complaints people hear? And they'll say, well, these, those college books just told me a lie. It's antiquated. It doesn't exist. Anyway, they raise you up in a system. And if your motivations are to achieve, to receive something of the world, you'll never see you're in captivity. You won't have time to look around and actually see what's going on. They have focused you so much in their realm. Oh, and by the way, that educational pattern psychologically also teaches you that if the system does not tell you something exists, if the system cannot confirm something exists, don't even think about it. Don't tell people about it. You'll be an outcast. You see, that's a form of control. You're an outcast if you believe anything the system did not institute. What you can call that entire process in common terms is a mind job. Why do you think people dispute and have a hard time believing what Jesus said? Because the world has taught them that all that stuff is nonsense. All of it's nonsense. And then when a Christian begins to experience those things that Jesus said, something happens just like Jesus said. Some people are overtaken by the cares of this life, the riches of this life, the pride of this life. And the word is tripped out of me. Some people receive the word happily. To them it's tripped out to you. Some people have no root. They have no root. They hear it. They go away like they never heard it before. It goes in one ear and out the other. If we would take the words of Jesus Christ and meditate on those words and apply them to our lives, you would understand first you are in fact a child of the Most High. You would also understand that the Most High is the creator of all things. Then you would begin to see that nothing can exist. Nothing can ever happen without the creator's express permission. You would also understand that your trials and tribulations are not for your destruction, but they are for you. You would also understand the events at the end and the prophecies are also for your ultimate deliverance. You would not look at these things in this dark, spooky light, but you would understand that God is allowing this for his process. He will get the glory. And you need to know this. If God gets the glory, then he glorifies himself and his children. How proud do you feel when you see your grandchild or your child accomplish the smallest tasks? How proud do you feel? And if you feel proud and they can, if you are so happy, it rubs off on them. You change their entire world. When the Lord is glorified, he glorifies himself and his children. Listen, you mean everything to your creator. It's time that people stop listening to Satan's words. Satan is the limitation nut. That's what he does. Anything you learn in the word, he'll send somebody to put limitations on that word. If the Lord says you can do something, he'll put stipulations on it. If the Lord said have faith, Satan will say it didn't work for you in the past. Stop listening to Satan. Take that with your thoughts. 
you need to establish it in your heart to know it's for real that the Lord's never going to leave you nor forsake you and that everything you've ever gone through in your life is for you is for you to God be the glory but you're the vessel in which that glory moves if you don't know who you are how can you stand for anything if you're walking around with an identity crisis and see what we're trying what we're what I'm attempting to do is simply to share with you some things that I have direct knowledge of one thing I have direct knowledge of one thing I'll continue to walk in until the Lord takes me away from here is that he is my father I am redeemed of the lamb I will endure until the end my redeemer is coming if I happen to go first before he comes I go to be with him I, you see I'm not worried about the common things mankind is worried with I'm not I felt pain massive pain I know what pain feels like. In fact, I know what pain feels like for two years in a row, straight, without a break. I know what that feels like. Do you really think that pain discourages me now? No, it does not. I've become a radical in my faith. In other words, I will believe when everything in the world says it's useless to believe, I'm still going to believe. I'm going to have that faith for one simple reason. The words of Jesus Christ bear witness in my soul. Nothing else bears witness in my soul. Either my soul is hard-headed, or, or something's going on here, because the words of Jesus bear witness in my soul. I cling to that. You see, when something happens, I don't cry to mankind. I cry out to the Father. People cry out to mankind. That's why their problems don't get solved. You see, if we cry out to the Lord for something, He fixes everything, even those things connected to it. He'll also fix those things you never thought existed that could potentially get in the way. He doesn't just fix one thing. He fixes everything connected to that one thing. And he heals it from the root. From the inside out, mankind cannot do that. I trust him. Do I worry sometimes? Yes, I'll start to worry sometimes. You know what I'll do? I'll pull a David on my soul. What is your problem, soul? I'll start flipping through scriptures. I'll find things. I consult his word. I'm not going to a, a, a psychiatrist. One of their books, right? Open it up and say, let me see. How do you calm yourself down? Let's see, step one. No, I'm not doing that. How to calm yourself down. This flesh is under my subjection. The Lord made it that way. He said, die to your flesh daily. And that's exactly what I attempt to do by feeding the spirit and not the flesh. In fact, when my flesh wants something, that's when I say, no, you can't have it. That's why fasting is good. You learn to overcome the flesh. But most people... When the flesh starts to cut up, they have to stop everything they're doing. All their kindness goes away. All thoughts of the Father go away. And they try to appease the flesh at that moment. Well, when my flesh really desires something, I say, nope. You see, I believe in the Father. I should have PTSD times 20 right now, but I do not. When you put your flesh under subjection, first of all, you got to believe it. You have to read it for yourself that you're empowered to do that. You have to know that you can, you're an overcomer. You have to understand what trials and tribulations are. You have to understand that you have to be a victim before you're a victor. You have to understand that you're stuck before you can be free. Do you have to understand these things and the trials and tribulations sent in your life were established for that reason? What have we done to most of them? As soon as we get into one, we don't want to learn it. We want to get out of it. Because we didn't understand that God's in control of all things. We didn't read Job enough. We didn't analyze things enough. We didn't meditate in His Word day enough. And so we couldn't see it. And we didn't let the process complete itself. And so we never knew that we could be a victor in the end. And when you squirm out of a trial and tribulation, when you continually do that, you're, you're conveying that your heart is set against going through it in the first place. That means you're not going to perceive the victory at the end, so it's useless for you to continue in that. Your perception is everything. If you're not going to perceive something as a blessing, you probably won't get it. That's why blank prayers are not good. You know those prayers you pray about? And someone says, oh, I like that prayer you said yesterday. And you say, what prayer? You know, that kind of thing. No expectation for the answer to that prayer. However, when it touches you deeply in your heart and you do pray about something, you will not leave the Lord alone until it's done. That's a real prayer. Certainly when it has nothing to do with you. Absolutely when it's inconvenient for you to do it. And you won't leave him alone until that prayer is answered for someone else and not yourself. Then something wonderful happens. Not only is that other person delivered in some kind of way or gets the victory or overcomes something or is healed or recovers, but you, something has worked out your life as well. Not only has something worked out your life after the other person is delivered or overcomes something, something of that nature, but then something changes internally within you because that person will normally tell you, hey, I'm, I'm due, thank you for that prayer. 
You can be overwhelmed with joy if you change your perception to faith works. If you can understand that these kingdoms of this world, who's really, who's operating in them, if you understand that scripture about not wrestling with the flesh, you need to read the whole scripture, by the way. Wickedness in high places. I mean, it just spells out to you what you're dealing with. If you can understand that when Jesus was being tempted, Satan showed him the kingdoms of the earth. Now, how can he tempt the Son of God, who knows all truth? How can he tempt him with a lie? That means Satan was a lying. He tried to make Jesus corrupt himself to go against the word of God. If you're loyal to these kingdoms of the earth, if your treasure is stored in these kingdoms of the earth, your treasure is going to burn up with him. But see, your heart is the truth of you. And one day, every this is what's happening right now. People can't act anymore. You see, it's gone beyond just entertaining someone. And it's turning real. And they're saying, well, I can't be that. And then your true self surfaces. See, yeah, for a long time, even things like this, were partially based in entertainment for entertainment. Well, guess what? The entertainment era is over. Things are becoming serious. You know what people are doing? They're saying, well, I'm, I'm just not going to be like that. I'm going to let them know what's in my heart. And when that happens, and when they begin to become what they are in their heart, they're exposed to what they really are. Then you're going to find a lot of people falling away from the faith. Because they never really accept it. Jesus Christ. You know, it's almost impossible to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Taste of His goodness. Experience Him and then fall away. You got to ask yourself, who are you loyal to? Because the beast system, they're adding to it each and every day. One day, somebody's going to take control of that beast system. That man of perdition is going to be revealed. Those ten kings who have not received their kingdom as of yet. That means they're not in charge and you don't know them. They haven't received their kingdom as of yet. They're going to be given the power as kings for one hour with the beast. They're going to hand their power right over to them. They're going to hand over the power straight to the beast. And if you're not careful, you're going to be one of those who worship the beast. Now, I'm going to ask you a serious question. You hear this term, strong delusion. The Lord will give them over to strong delusion that they would believe a lie, that they all might be damned. You all heard of that scripture, right? Part of that delusion, here's the thing about a delusion. First of all, if you've met a delusional person, they can't comprehend that they're living in a delusion. You see, a delusion begins, but to the person within it, it has no starting point. To them, it's reality. There's no way out. If we continue to love the world, your separation from the Lord will increase. If you continue to love the ways of the world and you partake in its ceremonies and your treasures reside within this world, you too will never see your way outside of a delusion. You know, I often think about that strong delusion. What happens to those who are born within the delusion? What happens? It's not going to be an overnight delusion. Delusions, they don't work like that. He does not jump out and go, boo, I got you. In fact, he hides himself. It's not being Satan at all. Did Adam and Eve know the character of Satan in the garden? Did Judas understand the character of Satan's ways? If he understood the character of Satan's ways, Judas would have never hung himself. He didn't. Judas Iscariot was in that delusion of his time. He didn't know. He didn't know the penalty of what he did. He did not know the outcome. See, when you're in a delusion, everything is delusion. What you hear, delusion. What you feel, it's delusion. It's not real. Now it's to the point where a great many spiritual things, delusion. Have you ever noticed that people that are delusional hear voices, talk to people? In some cases, they say they're hearing angels. They're hearing God's voice. God told them to kill those folks. God told them to go kill those folks. I'm telling you what I know. You can go research it yourself and find out. These people say they hear from God Almighty. They say they hear from God's spirit. They're committing murders with what they're hearing. These people are delusional. If a person casts away the words of Jesus Christ and they cop continue to compromise the words of Jesus Christ with this world, attempting to balance everything out, saying those terms that destroy the soul, I'm only human. No, not that term. If they say these terms, well, I love the Lord and everything, but this is reality. If they continue to do that, make excuses for their flesh, how come they can't tell their flesh, hey, you straighten up? 
Like David talked to a soul, encouraging himself, we need to subdue our flesh. We need to die to our flesh daily. When your flesh does something, don't make an excuse for it. Take it straight to the Lord. Isn't he the one anyway that can do what you can't do? Because if you keep falling for the same thing, you can't see it. You need to take it straight to him. The delusion is here. It's been working. You guys would not understand or believe what the crime rate is. People in a delusion, you see a false world. The world they see is not real. Their activities become distorted. Even their morals become distorted. The truth they hold inside is based on a lie because they're living in a delusion. They can't find the doorway out because there is no doorway. They're already in the delusion. Nothing, there is no door around them because nothing is real, though they may feel they're locked in. And the Lord said he's going he's gonna to get them over to strong delusion. A delusion is bad enough. A strong delusion, there's no way out. One of the parts of people being deceived is this. They say a delusion is coming. No, you'll never recognize that delusion. You have to have real discernment. You have to have the Holy Spirit operating in your life. You have to have the words of Jesus Christ within you. you you're going to have to have these things to even see it. It is not something visible to the natural eye. It is not. It's made manifest by the truth of Jesus Christ. It's made manifest, which is to say you can see it because it will be contrary to what Jesus said. You see, you have some people that say they speak by the Spirit and they say the opposite of what Jesus Christ said. Now, what is that? What is that? If somebody speaks the opposite of what Jesus Christ says, they speak against the words of Jesus Christ, what are they in? They're in a delusion because they really think they're speaking truth. But the words that they speak are against what Jesus Christ spoke. And, and if we have the warning, if anybody comes to you with any doctrine other than that which Jesus Christ thought, no matter who it is, what angel it get away from them. We had that warning. We also knew that they were coming. These folks are sitting in a delusion. They're in the delusion. If you are delusional, you believe in your cause. And if you're in a delusion, there's a power that they possess. You know what that is? Their words can draw other people into their delusion. But they speak against the words of Jesus Christ. That delusion is out there. And the more iniquity abounds, the earth is going to respond. This beast architecture is also out there. The foundation is being set. It's not going to be all conventional. Don't think you're going to be comfortable with what's coming. If you don't begin to see with your spiritual eyes, which is to see the words of Jesus Christ, accept his truth in your life, and let the Holy Spirit teach you what you don't know, things beyond what Jesus Christ said, the Holy Spirit will give you that. If you don't do that, and you're trusting in this world for answers, and you're seeking men and not God, you're going to be in big trouble. Some of those people who were in Egypt, some of them turned against the Israelites, and they were consumed by turning away. You see, in their minds, it was better. Their accommodations were better in the slavery than it was outside of the slavery. The same way some did fall away there, they're going to fall away here. The same way a generation had to die before anybody could get to the promised land. So it will happen again. Yeah, let me let me clarify this one. There are a lot of people who have already passed away. They could not accept the truths that you accept now. They did not have the mental capacity to accept the precepts that are being revealed now. They could not accept the revelation being given now. They couldn't accept it. Some of you with, with, with grandparents and so forth, they think totally different than you do. It does not make them bad people. They cannot accept the revelation that is being given today. They can't do it. They could not live in this time. If they could live in this time, they'd be here. They can't live in this time. The Lord did not make a mistake with any death or any birth. He knows what he's doing. We're the ones that have a hard time tracking what he's doing. But he knows what he's doing. Nobody dies by mistake. Nobody's born by mistake. Everything is for a purpose and a cause. We don't know those purposes and causes all the time because sometimes it looks terrible. He still didn't make a mistake. But a generation is leaving. Now where's that leave us? Even some of us in this generation, we can't take what we see coming. Because knowing was sweet in our mouth, wasn't it? To see it, 
bitterness in your belly. You all should understand these things are not against you, but are in fact for your deliverance. If you can understand that, we can get into the meat of the matter. But you really have to know who you are, how the Lord works in deliverance, and of course this ultimate deliverance. You're not the average ordinary individual. You should know this by now with yourselves. By the way, your, your, your colleagues and, and your uh, acquaintances and family and so forth look at you. You're a peculiar people, grafted into the branch, born at a very specific time with a very specific set of talents and passions, fine-tuned and being fine-tuned so that you can walk into your destiny. And you know what I saw, Michael, when you said we have to um, take it? I see it a different way, you know what it is? You see, I don't have to take it. I'm simply going to endure until the end. I'm going all, it's in my mind to go all the way. See, I don't have it in my mind to go halfway. And I think that's what you're talking about. We have to take it. We really do have to take it. But I like the term, I'm going to endure until the end. I will strive until I just can't simply, until my eyes shut and the oxygen stops flowing. How about that? That's what my mind is set on. And you see, I'll tell you this, if you have a strong enough purpose, if you have that strong hope in your heart, if you can recognize that your brothers and sisters are at battle right now, your strength, which will come from the Lord, will be sufficient so that you can walk into your destiny. You will endure until the end. But we have to make our minds up now, not tomorrow. We have to make it up. We have to make it up now. We have to choose this day whom we will serve. We have to do this every day, all the time. With every decision you make, you need to determine, is this actually serving my father in some sort of capacity? And if you don't know, go find it. Go look it up. Be nosy. I encourage you to be nosy with the words of God. Be nosy. And if you can't find it in the Bible, we'll pray about it. Don't let go until you get your answer. Be like Jacob. An angel said, let me go. The day is breaking. He said, nope. Not until I, I'm not letting you go until I get my blessing. He said, I'm not going to let you go until I get my blessing. Now, if he got away with doing that, then you know the Lord, the, the Father was sitting there looking at the whole thing as if to say, look at my, look at one of my children. That brings me glory. He harassed that angel until he got his blessing. He does believe in me. I'm guilty of harassing the Father too. I, I really am. There are times when I've said, well, Lord, guess what? If this doesn't work, it's going to be your fault, not mine. I've, I've got, you know what? I really did that before. Now, I know a lot of people won't understand that. But I said, you, you know, if you do this or that, well, then they're going to say, you're not there. You don't work. You're not, uh, you're, you're far in the distance somewhere. And sure enough, listen to me, sure enough, it works out. Somehow, somehow it works out. But I'll, I'll tell them. You see, when you honestly exhaust everything that you can do, the Lord will do that supernatural thing. When you exhaust everything that you can do, the Lord shows up on the scene. If you don't exhaust everything you can do, stop looking for him because you did not give it an honest, honest effort. Some of you folks that have that are runners and some of you folks that are in the military on a PT test, you see people running the two mile run, right? And if they start giving up for time, you say, go ahead, you push them a little further. Go ahead, you push them, push them, push them. But to the one where you try and push them to get him to pass PT test within a specific time limit, and they just give up. You kind of look at this individual like, oh, what a lost cause. But if they are trying and giving every effort, I'm telling you what will happen. You'll get people who finish the PT test that are tired that will run back out there on the track and encourage this guy all the way. Help comes. When you exhaust everything that you can do, help comes. Help is coming. It's on the way. Help is on the way. We do that too. If you drove by a person and they were trying to fix their tire, and you saw them, you know, bust their knuckles on the rim and everything, but they're still trying, they're still trying, and they can't get it. You automatically know, and you're compelled to go over there and say, can I help you out? But if you got another guy standing on the road, and he's not putting forth any effort, he's trying to stop you and say, can you help me with this tire? You're going to say, oh, no, I'm late. You're going to think of every excuse in the world to get away from that guy, because you know he can do it himself, but he just doesn't want to do it. You also know those situations but when you see somebody exhaust everything they can do you are moved with the greatest compassion 
something happens on the inside of you, and you will assist that individual. Do you not? The Lord shows up the same way. He's already looking at you. He knows when you have exhausted everything that you can do. He also knows when you have not exhausted everything that you can do. But I'm telling you, He will show up every single time. Having done all you can do to stand. Anybody ever heard of that scripture? Having done all of what you can do to stand. See, he requires 100% of our efforts, of what he has given us the ability to do, and anything you cannot do, he'll ensure it's completed. He works like that every single time. See, I love my Father in heaven. I certainly do love my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and I do blindly believe his word. And yes, I bug him, because I want to see it work. And then I get to see the examples. I'm going to give you a secret on something. You guys ready for this secret? Here's you can learn things in life one of two ways. You want to know what those two ways are? You can learn by revelation, or you can be sent through a tribulation. It's up to you to decide which way you want to learn. God will give us revelation, but we're hard-headed. We don't listen. And then we have to go through a trial to get our certification for that specific situation. Then we say, ah, oh, I see now. Let me tell you something. I would rather trust him wholeheartedly like a little child and learn everything by revelation, finding out something new. Your father tells you something. You say, ah, yes, I believe it. Let me apply it. But if you're one of those kids that don't believe anything your father says, he still loves you. He needs you to grow, right? He wants you to grow. He wants you to have the best that you can have, which is to make it home. Well, then you're going through tribulation so you can experience it yourself. And after you experience it, you'll say, never go that route. That didn't work out too well. Then you know. But if he reveals something to you, I'm one of those types. I don't have to experience everything. I don't have to experience everything myself. But we can learn things one of two ways. But a lot of us are hard-headed. I'm hard-headed. There's, I, I told you, I have many, many lumps. I don't get too many lumps anymore. You know, when the Lord speaks in that small, still voice, right? He reveals something to you. It's never at the, one of those opportune times where you're ready. You know, you can be sitting there with your pen and paper and get nothing. You go to sleep and have a dream. You get everything. You're too tired. You don't want to get up and write it down. You lose it all. Now you're going to go through it. And then when you start going through it, you'll say, I, dreamt, I knew this was going to happen. Well, how did you know that was going to happen? Because he gave you revelation of the consequences of something. How to overcome something. And if you don't, what's going to happen? He showed you how to do it. He revealed to you how to do it. Now the situation comes, and because you didn't do it, it's hard on you. He's not going to send the situation to you that you can't overcome. He's not going to do that. The instruction comes first. The revealing comes first, and then he knows the truth of your heart. So if you did not accept it wholeheartedly, you're going through it. That will permanently seal it in your life. For some of us, some of us go through the same thing more than once. Because even when we go through the trial, we're still murmuring and complaining. Oh, and by the way, by the way, those who murmur and complain in the desert, that's tempting the Lord your God. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. They tempted the Lord their God. That's in Hebrews. That's how you tempt God, by murmuring and complaining. This premise I'm laying down is simply for identification of who you are. You're not this ordinary individual who is tossed and blown by the waves of the sea. You're not at the mercy of anything. You're like a, 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 a four billion ton weight that nobody can move, but within you is the power to make yourself as light as the feather when you want to. And it's up to you if you're moved by things or not. So you started out lightweight. You're very heavy right now. Now you have that choice thing going on. Now if you choose the wrong way, you're going to be light as a feather, blown and tossed with the wind and by the sea. You choose the Lord, His ways, His precepts, His truth. You can't be moved. You will stand. Don't let go of his hand. Consider him in everything you do. Everything you do. You know, I learn that more and more every day. You know how I learn that? About considering him in everything I do? Is that often I make considerations that have nothing to do with him. And then I catch myself and say, oh boy, oh boy. And I'll start remembering what happened before when I didn't consider him in those things that I did. And it blew up in my face, and I thought, oh boy, let me slow down. I need to consider him first. And it causes me to go and investigate his word. It also builds understanding, knowledge. Once you have that knowledge, it'll be revealed to you how to apply that knowledge to your life, which is called wisdom. When you know how to apply the knowledge, you become wise. You become a person of wisdom when you know how to apply that knowledge. 
All of us go through a process to achieve that. Don't make excuses for your flesh. That's the very thing Satan works through, is your flesh. How many people know that? How many people even believe that? Satan works through your flesh. How many people know that? In fact, your flesh has the same traits as Satan. Without this premise, you wouldn't understand the fullness of the beast system. You wouldn't understand. You would not understand what you're up against. You see, this thing is multifaceted, certainly multidimensional. It's coming from all angles, and the only way you can be able to, to hope to survive it is with the blood of the Lamb. There's no other way for you to overcome it than by the blood of the Lamb. We see that in scriptures. They overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. In other words, they were not worried about anything. They certainly did not love the world. The blood of the Lamb they stood with, the word of their testimony continued to make them endure until the end. That's why they loved their life not unto death. They reflected enough that no one could speak their faith. How many of us are like that? Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemous. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved? If you're not willing to repent. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise 